for Carol Ann Bond. Carol had been federally indicted under the Chemical Weapons Act, enacted in furtherance of an international treaty, imposing a chemical weapon ban and making it a crime to knowingly possess or use any chemical weapon. Well, her crime consisted of applying highly toxic chemicals, which she stole from her employer, Dow Chemical Company, to the mailbox, car door handle, and house doorknob of her friend, Merlinda Haynes, who had been impregnated by her, Bond's, husband. Hmm. I thought it would get that reaction. <laughs> she challenged the constitutionality of the statute as applied to her, urging that it violated the structural limits of federalism. So Paul had to argue that the statute was unconstitutional as an invalid exercise of power, but he ran up against a problem. It's a thing called the treaty power. And if the statute has been enacted in pursuit of or in furtherance of the treaty, Congress has the power to, uh, to enact that statute. Now our court, the Third Circuit, on, I was on the panel, were confronted with a dilemma. The definition of the chemical weapon and the use or possess, what she did felt squarely within the definition of the statute and the treaty power. Well, we weren't about to undo the treaty power, so we ruled that the prosecution was appropriate. So it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court looked at it, and I think with some consternation, because they probably had the same problem with undoing the treaty power. They looked at the statute and they said, you know, this would invade the local, uh, the local territorial justice system because we've got a situation where this is essentially a state crime. This is an assault or an attempted murder that's being prosecuted federally. And if we say this is okay, it's really a problem. So they decided that the definition of the, the chemical weapon was so broad as to bring about an ambiguity and in, in the law. The word ambiguity means you get a green light to look at legislative history. So they looked at <laughs> legislative history and said, this isn't what this was meant to do. Uh, but I think there's some lessons there for judicial independence and the way that the courts rule. Paul? No, I, I think that's right. And thank you for having me here. I, you know, I think this is, uh, this is a, a tremendous uh, forum that you've put on, and I'm just you know, privileged to be a part of it. Um, you know, I do think the Bond case is, is a case that sort of shows a lot about uh, judicial independence or the judicial role that I think is an important ingredient to the discussion we're having about judicial independence. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I can't imagine that the, that the panel of the Third Circuit looking at this prosecution uh, thought, you know, way to go, U.S. Attorney. This was, this was brilliant. You, Anything you know, but. Yeah. Um, but, at, but at the same time, um, the court, you know, I think essentially thought it was constrained by, on the one hand, the text of the statute, and on the other hand, uh, this old chestnut of a Supreme Court case uh, called Missouri against Holland. And uh, so kind of constrained to essentially, you know, apply the law in a way that probably wouldn't be the way that the court would have applied it if they were just asking themselves the question, should this prosecution have been brought? Is this a good use of sort of federal prosecutorial resources? Any of those questions, the answer would have been different. But that's not the question that the panel was confronting. And I think that's obviously an important ingredient about sort of the judicial role and judicial independence. And then when it gets up to the Supreme Court, um, it, you know, it does show you that, you know, that court is a different court from uh, any other court in the federal system or in our, in our state courts. And there is a little more latitude. I mean, you know, if, if, if you know, I, I tell my clients, you know, if there's a Supreme Court case that's on point, it really doesn't much matter kind of which constellation of three judges on any one court of appeals we're going to get, because they're all going to be bound by that Supreme Court decision. But of course, you get up to the Supreme Court, and the justices aren't so bound. And that means that in a case like that, you know, Chief Justice wrote an opinion, the Chief Justice wrote an opinion that um, was a terrific opinion for my client, but would have been, I think, a difficult opinion for any court of appeals judge to write. Um, and conversely, I think there were something like three concurring justices who basically said, yeah, Missouri, Missouri against Holland was not Justice Holmes' finest work, and uh, we're, we're prepared to overrule it. 
So, you know, I think it, the, the case really does show that, you know, there, the judicial role is very different from just deciding kind of what you think is the just result vel non. And I think the Supreme Court's role is a little different from the role of other judges. And I think that, that, that may be something of a problem for the court system as a whole, because you have one court that's doing things a little bit differently, but yet I think in the public mind, it looms so large. And so people's perception of the court system and their perception of the Supreme Court are probably pretty hard to disaggregate. Okay, and I think we'll get back to that. But at the Supreme Court level, it still shows restraint because they had to be saying in that conference room, oh my God, we, we can undo the treaty power. But if we do, what does that do to international relations? <coughs> so I think there's a, there's a certain restraint there that was not only strength the Court of Appeals had, but from a policy standpoint, perhaps, and we won't quiz Justice Kennedy on this, but in the conference room, there had to be some consternation about that. Um, so for Kathleen, I was present when she, together with Judge Lewis Pollack and Dean David Levy, who you heard from before, argued in a debate sponsored by the American Philosophical Society that the Declaration of Independence was not treasonous. Kathleen's role was to debunk the notion that the colonists were the subjects of the king and should have been faithful to the crown. She did a magnificent job, and I rewatched it. One of my law clerks found it. It's either on YouTube or somewhere. It's fascinating. Um, she did a magnificent job asserting that they owed fidelity to British laws, which actually supported the grievances and not the king. The opposition consisted of three barristers from Great Britain who were arguing that, yes, the declaration was treasonous. Um, and I was talking to Kathleen about that, but did so in a manner that was almost like when you watch Parliament and they're a little bit buffoonery. And, and our side was so serious and analytical and persuasive. Well, guess what? It was no contest. It was not treasonous, of course. We knew that. So Kathleen, do you see any relationship in that to kind of what we're talking about today with courts and what they do? Well, very much. And Judge Rendell and everyone involved in the conference, I want to echo Paul in saying how grateful and privileged I am to be with you. Uh, we won the debate that night for a lot of reasons. First, because I was arguing with Dean David Levy and the late, great Lou Pollock, who could resist the three of us. But we were also against these very humorous British barristers who, uh, it, actually, it reminded me of the first time I went to the courts of justice in England and saw a oral argument in the British court at which the oral argument went on for a long time, no red lights, no 10-minute limits, <laughs> and the judges decided from the bench. And it was amazingly different from our cases taken under submission. And I walked out with the Queen's Counsel, who was my host. I was a baby law professor at Harvard at the time. And I said, that's amazing. You, this turned on the oral argument. And he said, yes, we in Britain have always wondered why you Yanks rely so much on the briefs and so little on oral argument when you speak so well and write so execrably. <laughs> Which I begged to differ. But I thought on that occasion we, we, we wrote and spoke well, but the reason was that we, had, we were advancing very much what Dean Levy so eloquently described this morning and Professor Jay elaborated on as the rule of law paradigm. It was the rule of law paradigm. It was contrary to the notion, and I loved that Dean Levy quoted some of those great lines from the usurpations list in the Declaration of Independence. I don't know if you, but I always tried to get my family to read the Declaration out loud on July 4th. They usually leave by the time you get into the usurpations. But the ones that were among my favorites is that he refused to allow us to set up the courts, and he made judges dependent on his will. So the rule of law paradigm that we were upholding was that no king is above the law, no president is above the law. It's the opposite of when President Nixon said that when the president does it, it's legal. Um, the, the notion here is that we were advancing the view that the rule of law is superior to the rule of people, of men, of kings, of people in incumbent offices, and that that's what the colonists were really embodying in their fidelity to British rights that had been established with Magna Carta and the British Bill of Rights. So, and I think we also won because we had a hometown crowd. Yes, you did. You definitely did. <laughs> it doesn't always work in Washington last night, but it worked for us in Philadelphia <laughs> that night. Um, you all have been before many, many judges. Um, can you think of instances where 
you know, kind of you had an epiphany that a judge really, really uh, you know, embodied judicial independence in his or her ruling or how they conducted themselves, Paul? Yeah, so, I, I, you know, this, it's a great question, and there's certainly, I, you know, I've been privileged to witness a number of examples of, of, of this, and, you know, th there's one Supreme Court case that I, you know, was really only tangentially involved, and it's, it's it, you know, it's, this is maybe too inside baseball, but to me, it, it, it really shows that the court is doing something different from any other branch of government and really takes, uh, you know, judicial independence but the judicial role very seriously, and it was a case um, called, you know, called, called CATS um, against, I think, Community College of Virginia or something. And it was a case about whether or not the application of bankruptcy law to states as defendants uh, was consistent with the 11th Amendment. And this is a Supreme Court case. And it was from the, that kind of, kind of interesting period where um, Justice O'Connor had already announced that she was leaving the court. Justice Alito was in the process of being sort of nominated and confirmed. But, but Justice O'Connor was still on the court for you know, something like four sittings of the, of the court. And in a lot of ways, it was kind of a, a, a special time as a court watcher because there were a number of cases, in, in addition to the Katz case I'll mention, where you know, the, the court confronted cases involving issues that you might have thought would divide them five to four. And because they were in this kind of strange situation of, you know, that for lots of it, they had eight justices because the chief was also getting subbed out. Um, and the court sort of found a way to decide these controversial cases in narrow ways that were unanimous. But the reason that Katz sticks out in my mind is because this was part of a series of cases involving the court's interpretation of the 11th Amendment as applied to state defendants. And in this long line of cases, you typically had you know, five justices um, including Justice O'Connor for most of them, but five more conservative justices who said that the 11th Amendment was an obstacle to these private suits against states. But toward the end of her tenure, Justice O'Connor had started to sort of come around on that issue a little bit. And suffice it to say that, you know, this Katz case seemed like a case that, um, you know, if, if the court waited and, you know, allowed Justice Alito to take the bench and replace Justice O'Connor, would have certainly been a 5-4 decision that said the bankruptcy code is, the bankruptcy power is no different from any other Article I power and there's an 11th Amendment problem here. But it became clear and it's kind of emerged at the argument, it looked like there were five justices, including Justice O'Connor, to say that the bankruptcy power was different. And what kind of struck me that's so special about this case is it was decided and the opinion issued on essentially the last day that Justice O'Connor sat on the court. And what that meant to me as a court watcher is any one of the four justices in the dissent, you know, could have simply said, you know, I'm just not quite done with this dissent. I, there's, just, there's just a couple of sentences <laughs> that just aren't singing. I need another oh, week. And if any of the four justices in the dissent had said that, I'm quite confident the case would have been decided the other way, and none of them said that, and the court issued this five to four quite consequential opinion um, that, you know, continues to be the law of the land and the rest. And I just thought, again, you know, it's, it's, it's a different story from a district court standing up to, you know, sort of resistance to segregation or kind of like a more obvious judicial hero story, but for me it kind of was a judicial hero story, particularly for the four justices in dissent. I mean, Anecdotally, I think one of them might be here today. Uh, but, but, but for those four justices to just, you know, restrain themselves, abide by the processes of the court, even though they could have flipped the position, and it, you know, it's, it's not the world's most important case, but it's far from the least important case, um, and that they sort of let the decision issue on schedule just struck me as, as, as a great moment. And I don't think, uh, I mean, I'm on a court, we have 14 uh, authorized and now filled judges, uh, I'm now a senior judge, but when I was on the, uh, an active judge, it's an institution. And we were talking this morning about accountability. We really view us accountable to the institution. And, um, and that, to me, that case speaks to that too. We're an institution, and this is the way we comport ourselves. You know, nobody goes rogue, nobody undermines anyone else. Our respect really is for the institution. I think that's a great story. Um, Kathleen, how about you? Well, 
Sure, and I want to echo here the optimism that President Gutman and Dean Levy expressed in their remarks this morning about how there are judges embodying the ideal of judicial independence and the rule of law or, and or legal culture paradigm all the time. There are, there are unsung heroes throughout the judiciary on a daily basis embodying that ideal. I really share that optimism very much. And when I was a professor, I used to teach that judicial independence is when a judge does something unexpected relative to prior expectations, like when Justice Scalia would lead a majority in voting for a criminal defendant in a Fourth Amendment case or a Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause case. When I went into commercial private practice, I began to think that judicial independence is whenever I won a case unexpectedly. <laughs> and uh, this has happened a couple of times and reinforced my optimism about judicial independence. And I'll give, I'd like to give one quick example from the federal system and the state system to connect up to our excellent panel this morning on the state systems as well. The federal example is I won a case for Entergy nuclear power of Vermont against the governor of Vermont, Entergy against Shumlin, it's called. It was a case in which Vermont sought to shut down the Vermont nuclear Yankee power plant on the border between Vermont and New Hampshire on grounds that we, on, on the company's behalf, argued were pretextual for radiological safety. And it was a very interesting case because we unearthed a lot of tapes of the legislative deliberations in which the legislators of Vermont who meet part time and are very wonderful concerned citizens had gotten together and they were cognizant of the field preemption of radiological safety by the Atomic Energy Act. Only the federal government can control issues of radiological safety. So they would get together and they would say, well, we, we don't want to have an accident, but we have to find another word for safety. And when you have a record like that, it becomes easy to say that the law was really, a, it was federally preempted because it was passed for the purpose and with the effect of invading the reserve federal power over radiological safety. It was tried before Judge Garmertha, the only federal district judge sitting in Vermont. It's a very small state. And I had a close, deep personal connection to the case because I had the privilege of clerking for the late, great Jim Oakes on the Second Circuit. He was the Vermont Second Circuit judge. And I had clerked in the post office with the district court that uh, I was arguing in. And my judge had always said, Kathleen, why do all my law clerks become law professors? Why can't any of you become a trial lawyer? And of course, his portrait was hanging on the wall above me in the courtroom every day as I went in to do the, the trial work in the case. It was a bench trial. And I would smile at him and just say, hey, judge, look who's a trial lawyer now. Uh, the case was entirely legal. And the, here was the problem. And this is the point about judicial independence. Vermont, a very small state, had its, its governor, its attorney general, its entire legislative branch, and the entire congressional delegation committed to shutting down the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. It was an uh, absolutely uniform, popular position. There were peaceful protests outside the courtroom each day by the very same people I remember from my clerkship. <laughs> and show up very peacefully and say, I don't like your position, but have a good day, in the way that people do in Vermont. <laughs> And uh, Judge, Judge Murtha, uh, against all of that political pressure, decided the case for Entergy, the Second Circuit later affirmed. And I thought that, um, you know, conversations at the local civic organizations might have been a little tough in the, in the aftermath, but he did it resoundingly in a beautiful 100-page opinion and without hesitation. And that was, to me, the meaning of judicial independence in a very small, closed world like that. An example from the state court system, I had the privilege of representing the governor of uh, New York, David Patterson, when he sought to appoint a lieutenant governor to fill the seat he himself had vacated when he was unexpectedly elevated to governor in the wake of Governor Spitzer's resignation. There was no clear statute that provided for the replacement of a lieutenant governor. There were clear statutes on the Senate getting to be involved in the appointment of, say, a vacant attorney general position, or and there was a residual default statute that allowed the governor unilaterally to appoint other offices from local you know, county commissioner on up the chain. And Governor Patterson's own attorney general refused to defend the appointment as constitutional. Governor Patterson was trying to make sure there was a lieutenant governor because the state Senate was deadlocked 50-50 on a partisan basis. There were important financial measures to be passed. The state was at some risk of serious financial default. 
and he wanted to appoint somebody, but his own attorney general wouldn't defend it, said it was unconstitutional, so he sought private counsel and our firm was retained and I got to represent him. The papers all said, this is ridiculous. How can the governor possibly appoint his own successor? It's undemocratic. And we, we went to uh, Nassau County, we went to the Supreme Court of New York, which is of course the lowest court in New York, go figure. You have to be a New Yorker to understand it. But the, we went to the Supreme Court, lost. We went to the Intermediate Appellate Court, lost. And then we went up to the Court of Appeals. And all along the way, the, the papers had covered this as the governor's lawyers are trying this quixotic, futile, hopeless effort to pr protect the governor's right to appoint his own potential successor to a vacancy in office. And of course, the Court of Appeals had four Republican appointees and three Democratic appointees. So it was just assumed that a Republican-dominated state court would rule against a Democratic governor in his effort to fill the lieutenant governorship. We went up to the Albany before the Court of Appeals, and we won the case. The governor won the case four to three. And the New York Times said, in a stunning reversal, the governor's lawyers prevailed. It was so expected that there would be a partisan lockstep vote, and it was so profound to me that uh, Judge Susan Reed, who had been Governor Pataki's counsel when she was, so she worked for a governor and understood the importance of the institutional role of the governor. Uh, she crossed, it, it, the way it was portrayed, she crossed over. She didn't cross over. She acted with judicial independence and a sense of the institutional importance, regardless of momentary partisan stakes, in voting for the governor's appointment. The governor's appointment went through. Richard Ravitch became the lieutenant governor. The deadlock was broken, and New York was able to pass some legislation again. Those two experiences, for me, profoundly illustrated the role of judicial independence and support the optimistic view that judges are unsung heroes every day. They're great stories. Uh, Paul, you were mentioning a couple minutes ago about the fact that the Supreme Court plays an outsized role in, in people's perception of what judges do. What can we do about that? I mean, obviously, the Supreme Court is important, but they fail to realize that they're the ones that Sandra Day O'Connor say, they get the puzzles. Mm -hmm. They get the puzzles where there, you know, there is no precedent, and there's a, there's a split among the circuits, and you, know, you could toss a coin just as easily as you know, pull your hair on some of these. And yet, that's not what most judges do. Most judges follow the law. How can we convey that to the public? That's actually going to be a topic this afternoon, but I'd like your views. Sure. No, I, I think it's I think it's a great question, and I do think that you know in this in this age where you know there there's you know the traditional media are breaking down, and there's so much information out there. I mean, I do think it's it's a challenge to get people to sort of focus on kind of the day to day work of the courts, and I do think though it really is important to figure out a way to communicate what. In the federal system, the district courts and the courts of appeals are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think it's important in the state courts as well. And I, I mean, one way I think about this is, you know, there, there, you have sort of a numerator, which is the really high-profile Supreme Court cases, and you know, for better or for worse, maybe we can talk about this. But for better or for worse, in some of the most high-profile Supreme Court cases, the court is going to be pretty divided. And I think the problem we have is that the public focuses on the numerator without seeing that the denominator is, you know, first, even at the Supreme Court level, as, you know, as, as, as Dean Levy alluded to, you have, you know, every year 30 or 40 cases that are des decided 9-0 or 8-1, and yet people don't seem to focus on those as much. And then you have this kind of vast denominator, which is the works of the work of the Court of Appeals and the District Court, and in so many of those cases, you, you know, the panel just, you know, it's not going to matter, and you're going to have, you know, a panel of sort of three judges who are, happen to be appointed by Democratic presidents who are going to come out with a conservative result and vice versa. And I, so I think that the challenge is to get people to focus on that denominator. And there, there's no easy solution, but you know there there are opportunities mm -hmm. um, where you know, and, and maybe it's not like you know in every case, but you know there are cases where, for one reason or another, and you know Kathleen you know pointed out one where you know that case was so important to sort of people in New York that people were going to focus on that case, 
Uh, and you do have these other, you know, opportunities. And sometimes it can be as trivial as the fact that the case involves a celebrity. And, you know, if you can get people to focus on some of those cases and what the role of the court is in those cases, I think it can be helpful. I mean, I'll just tell you, in, in, in my experience, one of the great missed opportunities was when the Supreme Court had a case involving the probate exception to diversity jurisdiction, a fascinating topic. <laughs> uh, but the there was outsized public interest in it because the probate exception to the diversity jurisdiction issue arose in the context of the will that involved Anna Nicole Smith. Bankruptcy case. And there was a request from the press for same-day audio release from the Supreme Court, uh, something that the court had done only, you know, rarely in sort of Bush v. Gore type cases. And the court turned down the request, and I think that was a huge mistake. Because I think actually to get the American public to focus on the fact that the Supreme Court decides cases like the probate exception to diversity jurisdiction and decides them pretty much unanimously and asks questions that make it pretty clear that most of them have no idea who Anna Nicole Smith is. <laughs> I think ultimately all of that would have redounded to the benefit of the court and I think it was a little bit of a missed opportunity. Well, well that's interesting. There are teaching moments yeah. in cases. Um, and maybe judges can do a better job of promoting judicial independence by using those teaching moments. Do you think there are things that judges could do well, I, I do think that anyone who actually watches a Supreme Court argument or gets to sit in on a lot of appellate court arguments would be moved by the seriousness with which the judges and justices take their mission and by the fairness of their uh, treatment of the advocates. And I think that you know, it, it's obviously been debated for a long time whether cameras should move into the Supreme Court as well as other courtrooms, but I think that it's probably been very salutary for people to be able to watch many state court appellate arguments and many now, I think all of the federal circuit court arguments on some form of, of televised, either live, live streamed or, or televised. In a way, the process is its own best advertisement for excellence and fairness. So I tend to think that that sort of sunshine is, is helpful. And uh, certainly the ability to get uh, the audio tapes of Supreme Court arguments the same week. It's very different from the old days where you had to, Linda Greenhouse and I were talking about the old days of having to wait for Alderson reporting to come out with the transcript with its pink ribbon a week later. So I think immediate access just to the process of judging through these means of new technologies is actually a helpful, a helpful way to see the courts mm -hmm. in action. And sometimes you see cases, opinions reported inaccurately or, or headlines that mislead and maybe it's because judges don't explain their reasoning in, in as good a fashion as we can. Maybe we are too academic and we should, we should give them the kind of the sound bites. In fact, I had a case um, several years ago, it was a very, very complicated case uh, involving a Federal Communication Commission. It took me 11 hours to read the briefs twice. It was very complicated. So uh, we ruled on it and we wrote an opinion and I got a call from a reporter and I usually wouldn't respond to that call but he wanted to know whether he was reporting it correctly. And I took down what he was going to say and I edited it and gave it back to him so that it would be accurately reported because it was, what I'd written was unintelligible. Um, <laughs> to the common man and maybe to almost any man. Um, but I th do think we could do a better job. Now how about lawyers? Could lawyers take certain steps to help judicial independence or maybe you know, come to the defense of judges or, you know, write an op-ed piece when they see something mischaracterized that a judge did. Do you think there are things that lawyers could be doing? No, I, absolutely, because I think that you know, lawyers are probably the best natural constituency for the judiciary. I mean, you know, if, 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 if we don't have, if lawyers don't have a fair and impartial and independent judiciary, I mean, in the long run, we're probably not gonna have jobs, or at <laughs> least, you know, the profession is gonna change in a way where you know the difference between a courtroom lawyer and a lobbyist is going to be collapsed, and you know that, that you know speaking only for myself, that probably wouldn't suit my skill set. So, so I think the you know lawyers have a vested interest in getting the public to understand uh, how 
the, 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 the court system works. And, and frankly, you know, I think that lawyers also are a natural constituency for this because you know, lawyers have a little bit of the same problem. I think in the current environment where things are so hyper-partisan, you know, the, a lot of the public you know, will just, you know, in the same way they want to look past the reasoning and the opinion and say, look, that was you know, a bunch of Obama judges ruling for a liberal cause or a bunch of Trump judges ruling it for a conservative cause. You have the same phenomenon where people just you know, assume that there are Republican lawyers and Democratic lawyers and I, you know, I think we all need to you know, try to do our best to educate the public and take these teaching moments and exploit them to say that you know, th there are special roles and special norms. Um, and you know, I don't mean to sort of say that's simple. You know, if you listen to Professor Jay, we are in a you know, period of intense anti-elitism. And it's pretty darn hard to make the case for judicial independence or even the special you know, role of lawyers without essentially defending an elite institution in difficult times. But I think you know, that's the, the, the fact that the challenge is somewhat daunting, I think probably makes it all the more important that lawyers kind of, kind of rise to the challenge. You know, David Levy was commenting that, that the judges are the worst people to try to make the case and argue, you know, on their behalf and get on a soapbox and say, no, I, you know, what I did is right. You know, we're, we're just neophytes at that. We shouldn't get into that game. Well, lawyers are not neophytes. They, they are good at arguing. They're good at, at advocating. Should, should lawyers, when they see something being misrepresented or a judge being uh, criticized for something that clearly is not what the opinion said, should lawyers as a group take it upon themselves to come to the defense or the offense even? Absolutely, and lawyers do have a vested interest, as Paul said, in, in, in doing just that. I think lawyers can speak not only through op-eds, but in the ways that we advise our clients. I, I, I was struck by your story this morning, Judge Rendell, about Justice Souter and the Russian counterpart, uh, the Russian counterpart marveling that uh, we get our decrees, you get your decrees obeyed, and that uh, a court could order the head of state to do something. It, it, it's something that I remember Justice Stevens saying at a conference long ago, that he too found that when he went around the world, his, his foreign counterparts were most impressed at the American system because American judges get their decrees obeyed. And I find a lot of times, especially in advising foreign clients, they don't have that expectation. And so I think we can educate our clients about the way in which you can't just predetermine outcomes in our system by identifying the judges and running a political profile on them. So I think we can do things in our, in our case management, we can do things in our public statements. I think lawyers can also show independence, as Paul said, by uh, crossing over in the work that we do taking on pro bono representations that don't necessarily fit what people think is our political profile and having conservatives go to the American Constitution Society Conference and liberals go to the Federalist Society Conference and trying to break some of the, the sense of a, a stranglehold that people have in the popular press. I railed for years at my friends in the press saying, please don't use the terms liberal and conservative justices in your articles. Now that seems quaint now and those terms are used so commonly, but I think anything we can do to try to break public perceptions that judges march in political lockstep is, is very important. Well, it's interesting, in doing a lot of work on judicial independence and you know, civics education, when Justice Souter said he had an epiphany, I thought that was really great, a realization that we don't appreciate our system. But it seems in talking about these things and trying to convey them to the public, you almost need to have a, a double epiphany. You need to first realize what it is, what judicial independence is. You need to understand it, or what a fair and impartial judiciary is. And then you need to have that other epiphany that says, oh, and it's important. And even though we can't convey it in a sound bite, we need to, we need to work on you know, explaining this concept. Um, you know, we have uh, things that either threaten or promote judicial independence, I'm not sure. Uh, the uh, question from one of the panels this morning that didn't, didn't get uh, answered, had to do with term limits uh, for judges. Um, any views on whether that would be good, let's say for the Supreme Court, that the president knows when he nominates someone that that person can only serve for 12 years or 18 years or whatever? How do you, how do you feel about that, Paul? 
So, uh, you know, I, I think that your reaction to a term limits proposal is probably a pretty good indicator of where you think we are. Because, you know, if, if you think that, you know, the battle for judicial independence has been at least partially lost, at least at the federal level or when it comes to the Supreme Court, then I think term limits starts to sound like a pretty good idea because, you know, it does seem a little bit weird that, you know, some presidents don't get to make a, a single appointment and then the next president gets to make sort of three or four in four years or something, you know, however the math works out. And the idea that, well, you could put in an 18-year term and every president would get two picks and over time that would mean that the court is sort of a reflection of the political will of the nation about 15 years earlier, you know, it, I mean, honestly, that is what you get roughly. And, you know, if, 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 if I were framing a constitution for a different republic, I could make a pretty good argument that that's, that's not a bad idea. But, but I don't know that you can really jump onto that proposal with, you know, two feet unless you think we've kind of already lost some of the battle. And so, you know, to, to me, you know, I try to be an optimist. So, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, maybe, you know, the, 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 the better idea is to try to sort of, you know, focus on kind of what we can do to sort of get a system where our current system for appointing federal judges that was the product of the framers' wisdom is, is more accepted, you know, by, by the people. And, you know, just, you know, just to maybe state kind of the nature of the problem, because I think, in a sense, that's unfortunately easier to do. Um, but it is, it is a real problem, and I think we, you know, would do a disservice to ourselves if we didn't focus on, you know, how difficult the problem is. And just two contributing factors I'll just point to is, you know, we're, we're in a period, because of all this sort of hyper-partisanism and polarization, that the political branches aren't addressing a lot of problems. And so that creates a, uh, a lot of pressure for courts to solve problems. But if the courts start solving every major problem in society, the idea that courts as independent non-political institutions are gonna, you know, sort of, that's gonna work in the long run, I, I, think, is, I think is problematic. I mean, I'll just, you know, pick one example from today's headlines, you know, to just sort of show the nature of the issue. I mean, think about the opioid crisis. Everybody thinks we have an opioid crisis at some level. Um, but, you know, the political branches really haven't solved it. And so now there's a lot of pressure for a single federal judge in Ohio uh, to, to solve this. And whatever you think pro and con, whether, you know, that's the exception that proves the rule, but if crisis after crisis gets solved by judges and not the political branches, I think that's a real sort of problem. And then maybe, you know, in, in smaller terms, you know, I, I, was, I was struck by sort of, you know, uh, Dean Levy's kind of obvious statement that it would be really bad for the justices to wear blue and red robes. But, but, you know, but part of me thought that would have been a little less problematic when you had Justice Stevens and Justice Souter wearing red robes, but deciding a lot of cases like, you know, sort of the blue voters <laughs> like. Red over here, or blue over here, right. we're red in the front, blue in the back. But, but right now, for better or for worse, you know, we have five justices who are relatively, you know, have a, have a relatively conservative judicial philosophy, all of whom were appointed by Republican presidents. And we have four justices with a different judicial philosophy appointed by Democratic presidents. So, you know, at, at this moment, when all these other factors are, you know, coming into putting a lot of pressure on the system, we have a configuration of the Supreme Court that gets outsized attention that is going to be hard for us to explain. People. So I don't think we should shrink away that, it's, that, this is, that this is going to be tough. Do you think the Supreme Court would be perceived as less political if we had term limits? No, I don't, because then you'd wonder as the person gets to the end of the term, is he or she deciding in a certain way because they're looking for the prospect of the next job, which was the same concern people had about congressional term limits. I, for, for better or worse, I want to say no, I think term limits would be First of all, it would take a constitutional amendment because you would have to overcome the good behavior clause. And just as the Supreme Court ruled in U.S. term limits against Thornton that a state could not put term limits on Congress people, uh, Justice Kennedy wrote a beautiful concurrence in which you said the framers split the atom of sovereignty in two. Uh, 
it would take a, 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 a constitutional amendment to do it, and I, I think it would be contrary to some of the spirit of our constitutional system. Yes, there are protections for judicial independence, but as Dean Levy pointed out in his remarks, there are also elements of, uh, in which the judges are not given independence from the political system. We don't appoint federal judges through uh, commissions of law deans or through a civil service promotion scheme the way they do in other countries. And frankly, people in other countries are often astonished at the way we do things. They can't believe we have civil juries and class actions and punitive damages and juries deciding patent cases. They have specialized patent courts in, in Europe and so forth. So it's unusual that we have our, so much kind of political input into our system, but our system is different from other systems. And I think some of the political ventilation, what Dean Levy called our raucous republic, that goes into the judicial nomination and appointment process is part of the way our system is built. So any attempt to neutralize and turn our system into a civil service system, I think would be somewhat contrary to our origins. The question becomes whether the political inputs become so divisive and vitriolic, and as Professor Jay described it as hardball, that uh, it begins to erode trust in the system. And so there I think you know, the answer is yes, politics, but not too much and not too destructively. And there it's efforts like what you're trying to do here to remind us of our culture and our shared values and what's in the hearts and minds of men and women about the system is the only thing that can save us. But I don't think that these procedural uh, fixes of court packing or term limits really can solve these problems in any permanent way. Great. Last question to each of you. Um, anything from this morning's program that you thought particularly interesting, unique, surprising from the, the speakers? Any, any takeaway? And uh, you all have quoted and referred to a lot of the speakers, so maybe you've already indicated what you thought was interesting, but anything specific? No, I'll just, I'll just underscore you know, a, a, a point I made earlier, which is you know, one of the things that uh, that Dean Levy said is that, you know, alluded to the fact that the Supreme Court decides, you know, a, a lot of its cases unanimously and, you know, to use his phrase, without controversy. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, it's, I, a little bit of the voice in my head was saying, yeah, without controversy, but also without commentary. I mean, you know, and, and, and that is what I worry about a little bit. So, you know, the problem with the denominator I alluded to is that, you know, all the focus is going to be on the cases that involve a handful of hot button issues involving things like you know abortion and race and that's what's going to drive public perception of the Supreme Court and the lower courts as a result and I, I think it's critically important to get you know get the get the public to sort of focus on some of those other cases um, you know my own bit of sort of you know self-interested advice to the court would be, you know, I actually think it would be helpful if they granted a few more cases. Because, you know, I think, you know, they, they, you know, if they granted more cases, I think there would be more cases that they would decide more or less unanimously. Um, and so, you know, I think if they were taking 100 cases a year and, you know, there were only, you know, 10 cases that were divisive 5-4 cases about hot button issues, it might be easier to make the point that no, you know, actually if you look at what they, what they do, most of what they do. And the other thing is to your point, Judge Rendell, you know, if they took a case every once in a while, not because the circuits were split, because it was the trickiest issue known to the federal judiciary, but they actually took a case now and then where the lower court, and since I'm sitting with you, I'll just imagine it's a state Supreme Court, but maybe the lower court just blew it. And, you know, it's important to the rule of law and the understanding of the proper judicial review to take that case and reverse it unanimously. And, you know, it, you know among Supreme Court watchers, you know, error correction, asking for error correction in a cert petition is a dirty word. Um, you don't want to, you know, don't, whatever you do, don't tell the court you think the lower court decision is wrong. Because um, they'll just say that's error correction. I can see the pool memo the clerk's going to write right now. Get rid of this. Um, and I think if the court were willing to take, you know, just, you know, a, a dozen cases a year that just because they were flat out wrong, those would probably be a dozen cases they decide unanimously, and I think it would redound to, to the benefit of the whole system. Okay, great. And the last word? 
Well, I would love the, case, the court to take more cases. I thought year. you'd agree. <laughs> <laughs> Especially important, on important issues where I do think the court plays a, a, such an important corrective role where there is political gridlock. Sometimes the court does have to put the system back into balance, whether it's a system that's gotten too protective of patent rights and the Supreme Court comes in and overrules the federal circuit to bring more innovation or whether the court operates as a corrective to majoritarian institutions, which was part of its role. You know, another word I've always tried to banish from dialogue in classes is judicial activism. Judicial activism is built into the Constitution in the sense that the court is supposed to be a counter-majoritarian check. And I've always been a kind of equal opportunity judicial activist. I think lots of things that get struck down are part of our constitutional scheme. So I, you know, I'd love the court to take more cases, but I, I'm not sure uh, that, that would diminish the tendency of popular commentary to seize on a few cases. When, back when the court was taking 150 cases a year, a lot of them on direct appeal from three judge panels, the nation still got agitated about church and state issues and school desegregation issues and focused on issues that were really 2% or less of the docket. But I do think Paul's point is extremely important. The issues that agitate the public press and the hardball politics that Professor Jay was describing are a tiny fraction of the work that the judiciary does, that these wonderful unsung heroes, the men and women of the bench, do day in and day out in a conscientious way. And we have to counterbalance any tendency to focus on the Supreme Court above all and those few issues, even at the Supreme Court level, as describing what the judiciary does. It does so much more. Our lives depend on it. And thank you for having this occasion for us to celebrate that role. Well, and thank you, too. These are two of the busiest lawyers in the whole country, perhaps in the world, and here they are. You got to hear from them. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. <laughs>